Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. Today is this month's patron pick, so I'd like to start out by saying how grateful I am to everybody who supports me on Patreon, and everybody who supports me through other ways, like watching my videos, subscribing, and sharing with their friends. This month's topic is, what would you do if the situation comes up that's not practical to handle normally? And so, I've got to admit, every month that I've had patron pick voting, I've had this one come up, and I feel kind of bad admitting this, but every time I've been silently rooting for it to lose. And let me explain why that is. The question basically comes down to what would you do in a situation where there isn't a really good answer to what you should do? And it might surprise some people to know this, but there isn't really a good answer to a question like that. And so therefore, there's not going to be any sort of thing that I can pull up from the comprehensive rules that says that I'm right or proceed through the policy documents and point out exactly what's gonna come in and help us out in the situation. Really, the only way that we can answer questions like these is on a case-by-case -case basis, and it relies more on problem-solving skills than rules and policy knowledge. Now, that's fine, but problem-solving skills isn't exactly something that I can teach through a YouTube video, at least not as effectively as rules and policy information. So this video isn't really meant to be an educational piece so much as to be a reflection or an opinion piece. Hopefully everybody is okay with that and everybody understands the reason why that has to be the case. So with that being said, what would you do if there was a situation coming up? And to get everybody on the same page, let's maybe examine, well, one of the situations that I came up with when I was thinking about this question. Let's say that Amy has a chance encounter and she has a frenetic freak and she wants to flip a million coins during Nick's end step. And of course, Amy doesn't actually want to flip a million coins, she just wants to be able to flip until she gets 10 wins, and then afterwards she doesn't care anymore. But Nick understands that after those 10 wins, he's not going to be able to win the game. Amy's going to win during her next upkeep, which is happening in just a few priority passes away. However, Nick has a plan. You see, after Amy wins her 10th flip, he says, hey, wait a minute, Amy, there's a couple more game instructions that you need to follow. Seems like you would need to flip another 999,980 coins in order to be able to proceed to your upkeep step. At this point, Amy of course calls for a judge, what would you do? And this is the sort of question that people a lot of the time will come up with when they're trying to stump their judge friends. And you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. This one actually has a pretty easy solution. As a judge, I would say that if you have a game state that is not significantly progressing, then you would be able to shortcut through. I would also rule that a chance encounter that has 10 counters on it is not substantially different from a chance encounter that has 15, 20, or even half a million counters on it. And so therefore, we would be able to skip through all the rest of these coin flips and Amy would be able to shortcut through to her upkeep like that. And I made a whole video where I talked about how shortcuts work and you could maybe argue among yourselves whether you think this is a good application of the shortcut policy or not. But at the same time, if we look at it from the lens that I talked about earlier, where we're looking for a problem solving sort of thing rather than something that fixes the problem through rules and policy, well, I think that this one fits pretty darn well. So that's stage one. Stage two, we could maybe think of something that was a little bit more complicated or a little bit harder. So, okay, maybe we don't have Amy flipping a million coins like that. Maybe we had Amy make a million creature tokens through you know whatever your favorite infinite creature token combo is. Of course, you can't make infinite creature tokens. You have to make a finite number of them. So we'll say we made a million squirrel tokens. And so after that, we're going to play a scramble verse. Don't ask me why somebody who controlled a million squirrel tokens would play a scramble verse instead of just attacking for a million. But hey, you know what? This is the sort of thing that happens in judge questions all the time. People making illogical situational decisions just because it comes up with some sort of interesting interaction. So let's say, what would we do in that situation? And this one is a little bit harder. You know, you can't really shortcut through uh, all of those coin flips because each individual creature does have to have a controller. And it's not certain statistically how many creatures each person is going to get. So if you were a mathematician, this might be where you would pull out a chart and start talking about probability distributions. Or you would maybe find some sort of a way that you could model a million coin flips in an easier way and be able to cut through a little bit faster. But at this point, we have to ask ourselves a really important question that doesn't really get brought up very often in situations like these, which is a question of jurisdiction. So here's what that means. Let's say that I'm a judge and I'm judging a magic tournament. Scrambleverse is legal and modern, so we'll say it's a modern tournament. Now, do you think that any modern tournament 
is going to have a player going to be able to make infinite creatures and not get their infinite creature combo interacted with and not have the opponent scoop to that and then play a Scrambleverse, which is a six mana sorcery. It turns out that that sort of thing has never happened nor come close to happening at any tournament that I've judged or heard of judging in the last five years at least. But, you know, hypothetically it could, right? And this is where the question of jurisdiction kind of becomes clear. This sort of thing doesn't actually happen in any Magic tournaments. Even at FNM level, uh, it's very rare for something like this to even approach happening. You would need to have a lot of different cogs aligning exactly perfectly. Where this sort of situation actually happens is in a competitive free environment where people are actually able to make infinite creatures and then do wacky six mana sorceries and see what happens. And so if that's the sort of situation that you find yourself in where one of these types of questions comes up, I encourage you to think a little bit outside of the box. If you're playing in a kitchen table just for fun game, then there's absolutely no reason at all why the rules of magic policy should really constrain what you're trying to do. If you and your playgroup agree on what the answer is, well, that's the answer, and whether or not the magic comprehensive rules say it is, is kind of a moot point. So for situations like this, the real answer is you would ask all the people at the table what they think the right answer is, and then they would agree, and then you would be able to proceed in your game. That's a lot neater and a lot more realistic and probably a lot more practical than trying to debate exactly what you would do about each individual creature token and trying to come up with the bar graph that shows the exact probabilities of each person getting a specific number of tokens. That sort of thing is kind of fun for people to think about in PhD dissertations. And if Magic the Gathering judging ever had some sort of a PhD dissertation, I'm sure that that would be part of it. But at the same time, when we're dealing with real questions, we have to somehow bridge the gap between real situations and hypothetical ones. And that sort of bridge is the sort of thing I feel a lot of people don't spend a lot of time appreciating in coming up with questions like this. Well, hold on, Dave. Just because you don't think that it's likely that this sort of thing could happen in a Magic tournament doesn't mean it couldn't, right? And okay, you know, that is true. It is certainly possible that someone could come up with a Magic tournament uh, and, and do this sort of thing in there. Um, I think it's more important to know exactly what you would do if this came up in a real game, and that's by far more likely to happen in a kitchen table game than in an actual tournament game. But hey, you know what? Judges are uh, called upon to judge all kinds of different Magic tournaments. So who knows what sort of things could happen in a real Magic tournament, and there's absolutely no reason why this couldn't. So let's keep talking and see maybe if we could figure something like this out. And incidentally, this is where another kind of rules question like this can sort of come in. And as a judge, especially a judge who has a really strong reputation for being interested in interesting types of rules questions, uh, I get this sort of rules question a lot. And uh, it's a question of the form, well, okay, Amy plays Replenish while her graveyard contains these 75 enchantments. And what happens? And then the person looks at me as though I'm about to tell them an answer. Um, I hate to break it to people, but as a person, I don't really identify as a computer uh, it would be very difficult to come up with an answer to a question like that in real time. Uh, it's, it's not really feasible, uh, but a lot of people like to think about these types of questions. Uh, for me, I don't think it makes a really good question for a rules and policy um, educational channel because, well, the pedagogical value of questions like these is pretty dubious. You don't really have any interesting interactions going on from the standpoint of stuff that requires you to think hard about how you apply policy and really understand what the policies are and why they're in place and how they apply to this specific situation. The only real difficulty to this sort of question comes from the fact that it's extremely complex and it has a lot of moving parts. Any judge who understands how continuous effects work could at least in principle work their way through a question like this. It would just be really difficult and really tedious. And let's be fair, judges have time constraints on the amount of activity that they can do in a given day or even a given tournament, and it's not really plausible for a judge to be able to have so much free time that they could sit through and crunch the numbers on this, only to hear the inevitable second question, okay, well that's cool, but what if I also had these, and then they put like five more enchantments into the mix. I understand that this makes me somewhat of a wet blanket here, but this is in fact how actual judges work through actual problems like this. Uh, the real, 
I understand that this makes me somewhat of a wet blanket, and there definitely are judges out there who delight in taking these types of rules questions and coming up with lots of extra enchantments that they could put in to make the situation even more interesting, but for me, I have a rule that says, mm, I won't really think about a question that has more than three specific cards in it if it's not actually related to a game that actually came up. This is another reason why I really like the True Stories Collections questions, because these ones actually do have situations that actually did come up. It's also something that I take great pains in as a question writer to try to distill even the most complicated questions down to a situation that involves an interaction between only two or three real physical cards. It's my solemn belief that if you have to ask someone to spend 80% of their brain power just comprehending what's actually happening in a rules question, there's no plausible way that they're going to be able to spend the other 20% of their brain power actually puzzling through and figuring out exactly what does end up happening in this sort of situation. But we still have the same objection that we had in the previous round, which is that even though this sort of thing isn't likely to happen in a tournament, it certainly could. So what would you actually be doing? And well, okay, here it is, the last piece of advice, the final long-awaited finale for this question. Just puzzle it out. I know everybody's really shocked to hear this one, but that's really what the answer is. You know, it's pretty complicated, and it could certainly be too complicated to puzzle out, but at the same time, you certainly could do it. If it could actually come up in a Magic tournament, there's no reason why you as a judge couldn't go through all the steps necessary to take the answer down. And if all of the steps are things that you could do with just basic rules fundamentals, then you should definitely be able to carefully work your way through and reason your way through how all of those different fundamentals interact. That's another reason why I really stress having a strong core foundation, which you can use and build up to doing any sort of rules question that you're likely to encounter. So let's just think about an example where this sort of thing happened. And yes, it actually did. Back in the days when Cons of Tarkir was a standard format, there was a standard deck called Abzan Control. There were a lot of games in standard that came down to people with triple digit life totals flipping over card after card with Mastery of the Unseen. Meanwhile, the judges were cursing under their breaths and wishing that one of the players would just deck out already. It was extremely excruciating, but the moral of the story is that the judges, we really did it. At that time, there was absolutely no reason why a judge couldn't competently go through and work out exactly how much life a player would have. I remember personally sitting through some of these matches, bored out of my skull, hoping against hope that one of these players would accidentally draw some extra cards or get caught cheating somehow so I could not have to watch this game happen anymore. It was extremely excruciating and I could tell the players hated it too. At this point, it's important to come full circle and remember what I said at the very beginning of the episode. Sometimes you have to think outside the box a little bit. There are some other card games out there where it's against the rules to offer a draw to your opponent or to agree to intentionally draw a match. Magic isn't one of them though, and seeing that this is perfectly within the rules, it's perfectly within your abilities as a judge to suggest this alternative to players who otherwise would not be able to finish that game before time is called in the round. Again, it's important to understand exactly what everybody's after here. And if you are able to think outside the box a little bit, it's very likely that you can come up with a way for everybody to get what they want. If you're actually dealing with a player who plays a combo deck that gets a million tokens and instead of winning with them, they play a scramble verse, well, I think it's pretty clear what that player wants. And so it's up to you as a judge or as a person who knows a lot about the rules to be able to work with those people and find a way where everybody can win. I know that a lot of people are probably gonna be dissatisfied with this answer, but at the same time, this is the best answer that I can give to a question that doesn't really have a great one. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much to all of my patrons for whom I made this episode. I really enjoy having these patron pick episodes, especially the ones that push me outside of my comfort zone because it gives me an excuse and an impetus to do stuff that I wouldn't ordinarily do. My first patron pick episode, which covered banding, was also an episode which I would have never done on my own. However, because I knew that there was so much fan interest, I wanted to do it anyway. This sort of thing helps keep me in touch with all the people who are actually watching, and for that especially, I'm very grateful. Thank you all for watching, and I hope everybody has an awesome day.